Greetings, fellow Beyonders. I am your humble host and scribe, Sven, and this is Beyond the Worlds Beyond. The primary purpose of this series will be exploring the lore and story within these campaigns. In this episode, we'll be looking at the third episode of The Wizard, the Witch, and the Wild One, titled The Charter. We'll be doing a quick summary of the episode and then diving into the lore questions that it raises and those that it answers. This episode picks up with our trio catching up with each other over some of what has happened in the intervening years, as well as a brief, if wonderful, meeting with Oscar, one of Ursuline's troopmates who seems to have been a true friend of the Wild One. It is also here that those who had not listened to the children's adventure learn the fate of Sir Curran, that time flows differently between the realms and that meeting occurred ages before the modern time and the Age of Knights has passed from this world. We learned that Wavebreaker was last in possession of a hedge mage in Port Talon by the name of Finley. We also learned that Port Talon, also on the island of Akam, is on the same facing as Joris but at the opposite end of the long, narrow island. As such, after a night's hospitality with a local mother, our trio of adventurers and a fox decide that taking a ship would be the most expedient method of reaching their next goal. After a failed attempt to commandeer the Capria under Captain Karkov, they instead settle for less stately and much cheaper passage aboard the Rowan under Captain Emless. During the journey, our heroes continue to get reacquainted, learning more about the time that has passed and having sparring practice between Suvi and Ursalon. But the episode comes to a head when Ame, spending some time crafting on her own, finds herself cornered by the captain, or perhaps by something within the captain. Commenting on having known many witches, and that Ame seems a small and sweet one indeed, as darkness slithers from her distended mouth. Thus, with another tense cliffhanger, does this episode end. This episode was a lot of inter-character work, but has still answered and posed questions for us to examine. Before we start asking new questions, let's take a look at the ones we've asked before and see which, if any, we now have answers for. We have learned the partial answer to the fate of Sir Curran, something already known to those who listened to the children's adventure, and the reason why Ursula did not meet Suvi and Ame in that portion of Preludes. There was a great span of time in between. Exactly how long remains to be seen, but it definitely sounds like more than a century. We also might have learned more about the Dominion in conflict with the Empire. There is mention of a Dominion of Ruve and the sorcerers that serve it. While it is possible that there are multiple Dominions within Amora, I suspect these two are one and the same, which would, in turn, suggest that Galthme is the Protectorate, though that is still not a certainty. We also, surprisingly, received a likely answer as to whether Ursulon considers mortals in a romantic or carnal fashion, given one of the souvenirs we learn about among his belongings, though the answer as to whether his glamour has physical substance or simply hides his true form remains unanswered. We've also learned more about the desert surrounding the Citadel, uh, that it was once a beautiful forest until the ire of the wizards led to it being glassed. We still don't know the nature of this conflict. We know that wizards found the secret of the lingua arcana, the secret of where spirits gain their secrets and magic from. Was the secret taken by force? Was the destroyed forest part of the great forest before the wizards and the citadel reduced it to barren glass in their quest for power? As for new questions, the first and most obvious is what is the nature of Captain Endless? Has she always been a supernatural being? I suspect instead that this is likely a case of possession or corruption, likely stemming from the curse that our heroes are fighting. The black coming from her mouth, um, being very reminiscent of the smoke leaving mouths of those afflicted by the curse. If it is not a case of possession, is it purely luck or fate that the being was on the vessel chosen by our cast, especially since it was not their first choice of conveyance? Uh, it seems unlikely it could be lying in wait for them unless it is a case of possession or corruption by the curse. Further point, in my opinion, towards that being the conclusion. But we'll have to wait until the next episode to find out. Hopefully, we'll find out. On the topic of the Dominion of Ruve, we have to wonder about the nature of magic of their sorcerers. Are they mechanically sorcerers as by the rules, or is this just an in-world term that may or may not stand for such? 
The peddler did tell tales of those with magic due to sharing the blood of spirits, so it is likely that these sorcerers are such. If so, does this mean that Ruve has closer relations than we see within the Empire when it comes to spirits? Or is this all a matter of far history that does not necessarily apply to this day? That's all for this installment of Beyond the Worlds Beyond. As always, please feel free to throw your own questions and theories in the comments, as I love hearing what others have latched on to. I've been your host, Sven, and thank you very much for listening. Farewell, for now, fellow Beyonders.